welcome to the show. I'm your host, Victoria Turner, and this is Powerful People of San Diego. Today we have an extraordinary show for you. We have Mr. Ben Davidson of Devotion to Dogs. Thank you so much for coming, Thank Ben. Thank you so much for having me. Ben has saved the lives of numerous dogs, dogs that were going to be euthanized because of behavior issues. Ben, can you tell us about Copper? Sure. Copper is a uh, red-nosed American pit bull terrier. Uh, he's three years old. He's my personal dog, he's my buddy, he's my partner, he works with me, helps me rehab aggressive dogs and dogs that are fearful and so on and so forth. So he helps me kind of break down the walls that the dogs put up and he helps give uh, clarity to other animals that don't really understand what's going on. Tell me what, what you have trained uh, Copper to do. Um, Copper is trained to do all sorts of advanced obedience, retrieve items for me. Uh, he works with me on appointments, so when I work with aggressive dogs, I can put him in a down or stay or have him walk with me, and he's not reactive in any way, so if they lunge at him or bark, he just moves out of the way and doesn't, doesn't, uh, he's not offended by it. Mm -hmm. And so that helps us when these dogs are, are lunging and they don't get feedback from the other dog. Um, <laughs> It helps the process. And we're going to have three segments with three different dogs today. Can you tell us what the first segment is? Uh, so the first seg segment we're going to be talking about exercise. Uh, super important, uh, common misconception in the world with training uh, and people and their dogs is that they don't exercise them enough. And they think that uh, just plain walks, that they cut it. And they don't. And we'll be explaining some of that today. That'll be great. Well, I'm going to leave you and you can show us uh, this great tool that most people should have in their homes and why, explain why they should have it. So Ben, take it away. Thank you. So uh, this morning I brought in my dog pacer treadmill. The reason why we use a dog pacer, uh, it's a longer mill, as you can see. Um, the thing that's really important for dogs when you're exercising them is that the, the gait of a dog is really important. So if you put them on a short mill or something and they're walking and they can't stride out, um, it's not healthy for them. So we want to make sure that we have a nice long mill that they can work on. Um, I like Dog Pacer just because it's user friendly. Uh, it's, n it's a nice a nice tool for what we're doing. So I've trained Copper to walk on the treadmill and the reason why I treadmill my dogs is the average pace, Copper, come here, go to work. Average pace of a human walking a mile, stay, is uh, 17 to 21 minutes. Average pace for a dog walking a mile is 7 to 11 minutes. So the thing is, is that even if you walk your dog three, four, five miles, two miles, whatever you're doing, what happens is, copper stay, um, it's not far enough. And so we think we're doing good by the dogs, and we think that we're walking them enough, but it's just not cutting it. And so you have a lot of behavioral issues that you see consistently across the board with dogs that just don't get enough exercise. So a treadmill is a really good way. One, if it's hot, it's raining, um, you're not feeling well, you broke your foot, you hurt your knee, any of those things. Now this doesn't negate a walk. You still need to walk your dog, it's very important. But you need to make sure that you're meeting your dog's exercise needs. And so this is a tool that really does that. So Copper's trained to walk on this. I just turn it on. I ask him to walk. I hang out with him. Pat him up. Let him know I appreciate his work. He's a good boy. He's doing a good job. That's a good boy. Huh. And I'll sit here and let Copper work out for a little while. And when starting off with a treadmill and treadmilling your dog, generally you want to start off with maybe five, three to five minutes five to seven minutes, keep it short. Let the dog have fun, let them learn. Um, as they get more proficient, you can get up there in your time frame. You know, you can start doing a half hour, 40 minutes, an hour, depending on the dog. Um, sometimes 15 minutes, it really depends on the dog. The dog's gonna give you uh, clarity on when they start to get tired. They start to pant, they start to get fatigued, those types of things. Now, this tool is not to just run the dog ragged. This tool is to make sure that the dog's health needs are met. When dogs don't get enough exercise, cortisol levels in the brain are increased and it causes a lot of stress. Okay? So it's really important that we get enough exercise for these dogs. Like this dog right here requires a two, ton of exercise. The average working breed requires about two hours of exercise a day. And a lot of people don't understand that. You've got herding breeds, you've got pointers, terriers, uh, labs in the sporting group, all these different dog groups. And what happens is they have a certain amount of exercise needs they require and they don't get it and what happens is they get frustrated they get stressed out and that's when you're seeing aggression reactivity a lot of fear-based stuff and when the dogs are exercised properly they're a lot calmer they're more relaxed so it's super important that we have tools like this because maybe you're elderly and you can't walk the dog as much as it requires or maybe your dog's not friendly with other dogs and you can't take it to the park and, the park and let it off leash and throw a ball for it it's just not going to work for you so you want to make sure you want to make sure that you have different avenues for exercising your dog. It's super important. So for me, I'm really big on treadmill training. Um, super important tool. And if you're rehabbing dogs, like we do, I can put numerous dogs next to each other. Come on, buddy. Come on. 
Yeah, good job. I can put numerous dogs next to each other and desensitize them. So I can have this dog working, this dog working, and they're working and focusing on their tasks and not worry about eating each other. So we do a lot of behavior modification. You can see copper's starting to slow down on me. So I'll slow down the mill. And so you don't want to just push him and be like, oh, I'm going to work, work, work. If he's saying I'm tired and I don't want to walk anymore, I slow it down. I let him meet his pace. Kind of let him work through it. Pat him up. Good boy. And if I see he's fatigued and he's tired, I take him off after that. And one big thing when you're exercising your dog, it's really important. Don't go give them a whole bunch of water and feed them afterwards, okay? Super important. And what happens is a lot of people exercise their dog. They'll get it really hot. They'll work them real good. And then they give them a bunch of water. And what happens is they get bloat. So it's super important that you don't do that, okay? So when you get your dog off a mill, you ran him at the park really good, what you do is you can let him get water, maybe five, four, five, seven laps, something like that. One, two, three, four, five licks of water, six licks of water. Wait 15 minutes, then give the dog more water. Making sure our dog's exercise needs are met is super important. If we don't, what happens is you have a stressed out dog, an anxious dog, a dog that wants to jump all over everybody, maybe a dog that's frustrated and now it's aggressive because its exercise needs have not been met. So make sure you're answering that question. You look at your dog and make sure you know you're meeting your dog's exercise needs. So super, super important. And if you need help treadmill training, give us a call. We'd love to help you um, and get you taken care of. So when I'm introducing dogs to the treadmill, because um, we just talked about treadmill training, one of the things that we like to do is we like to use food, have the positive association with the treadmill. Maggie, come here. Get her on. Good. I reward her with food. Let her come back off. Good girl. Nice job, Max. I might even take food and throw it on there. Let her get up get comfortable. Good job. Good job. As you can see, she's a little hesitant. She slipped on it, so... Nice job. Here. Nice. I'll lure her. Nice work. Nice job, Max. Hmm? Sorry. Sit. Down. Down. Nope. Yes. So one of the things that we want to start doing when we build in uh, when we start building dogs back up, when we start creating clarity and we want to build confidence and have them start to understand things, we want to set up a system of communication that they understand. So one of the things that we do is we teach them a marker system. A marker marks the moment in time that the dog uh, does a specific behavior that we like, and then from there we build upon that. So the first thing I like to teach the dogs is a yes marker. Dog sees food, she follows, I give her the food. So the first thing you want to do is you want to teach your dog to follow food. Dog follows, they get food. Dog follows, they get food. Once I know that the dog is going to follow me, I start labeling it. Okay? So I say, yes, perfect. Yes, and then I move. Dog follows, perfect. So once the dog understands that the yes marker marks the moment in time that the dog's about to get some food, yes, perfect. Yes, I can start laying that into having some obedience behind it. Sit. So in the beginning, yes, when I'm teaching a dog a new command, I'm going to assume they don't know anything, okay? So I'm not going to say uh, sit or a down. I'm just going to lure the dog. I'm going to lift my hand up. She sits. I give her the food. I do it once or twice. See if the dog sits. Good. Give her the food. All right. So now I know that she's sitting. I'm going to label it. So what I want to do, sit, yes. I say yes. I move my hand back, dog follows me. Sit, yes, dog follows me. So now she understands when her butt touches, I say yes. It marks the moment in time that the dog did the correct behavior. It's super important that the dog understands what I'm asking because if she doesn't and she doesn't understand what I'm saying or the moment in time that she did the correct behavior, she's not really gonna be clear on what we're asking. So it's super important that she knows this. So I get the dog to sit, sit, yes. Dog follows, dog gets food. Sit, yes, nice. Now that I've got my dog sitting, I'm gonna to try to lure it into a down. I'm just gonna simply drop my hand down, dog follows, I give it food. Nice job, Max, nice job. Let's see, I'm gonna go down again. I'm not saying down yet, because I don't know if the dog's gonna do the behavior that I like. Now that I'm seeing she's consistently going to a down, I'm gonna label it, down, and then I drop my hand. You always wanna have your verbal marker, whatever word you're using to create a behavior, come before you do any hand hand movement because the thing is if you're saying down and moving at the same time what's going to happen is your dog will never get away from doing hand signals so they're going to struggle with that so we want to make sure during this exercise I say down 
Good. Sit. Down. Nice work, Mags. Okay, so the other type of marker that I'm going to use is good. Now, good's more of a stay marker. Good helps you with, um, if you tell the dog sit, dog sits, I say good. The dog's not supposed to move from there. The dog's supposed to stay in a sit. Yes is like a release marker. Let me explain. Sit. Yes. I say yes. The dog follows me to get its food. And this is fun because it makes it more interactive for the dog. If you're always doing sit, good, down, good, sit, good, and the dog doesn't move, it's not fun, they're not running around, they're not having a good time, I want to make sure the dog's excited, I change things up for them. So this is a really good way to do that. Yes, I release her. She knows she's got food coming. She's having fun. So now if I want to tell her good, sit, sit, good. Give her the food. We don't move on goods. Down, good. I expect her to maintain that. When I want to release her, I say yes. Now she's done. She's finished with that exercise. So super important you guys get to practice this at home. So if your dog doesn't know any of this stuff or it does know it, you can practice your markers at home. I can ask for something they already know, maybe a down, down, yes. Have the dog follow you, they get food. Sit. You okay, kid? Sit. Yes. Nice job, Mags. So once you get this system in place, you can have the dog do all sorts of cool stuff, follow you around, you can train them to do anything you want. Yes, she follows. I can get her on the treadmill. Sit. Yes, nice work. So a lot of times what you see is dogs will have uh, a sit or a down and they say good. Another thing you want to work on, it, it, you get stuck in that. You sit good, down good, and the dog's just sitting there. They get bored, they walk away from you. So by doing a lot of yeses, it keeps the dog engaged. It, keep it, it keeps it fun for your dog. Another thing you want to work on too is engagement. What do I mean by that? I tell my dog down, down. Good. Another piece of food. Another piece of food. Another piece of food. Another piece of food. And the reason why I do this is because sometimes if I give the dog one treat, the next time I give them two, then four, then two, then one, then three, then one, the dog's going to stay focused on me during training because they don't know if I'm giving five treats or two treats or one treat. They don't know. But the thing is, you see how she's staying watching me right now. If I wasn't doing that, she would be like, oh, I got my treat. We're done. We're over training. There's nothing else to do. But because I do multiple treats, she's going to stay engaged. Yes. She's going to stay focused and she's going to stay with me. A lot of times people will train. They'll tell the dog something. They give them a piece of food and the dog thinks it's over with. You want to keep training fun and exciting. Keep delivering food. Change up the variation of how many treats you're giving. And practice your markers. It's super fun to do this, guys. So I have her sit. Yes. She follows me. She gets food. Nice work, Mags. Sit. Good. Uh-uh. Sit. Nope. Sit. Good. Nice work, Mags. Good. So from here, I might go practice a stay command or a come command. Yes. Nice work. Good job. Good. So that's just a little bit of how we start training these guys and teaching them the obedience and the commands. You want them following food? That's the first step. They follow the food. They get food. Perfect. And then from there, I can lure the dog to do pretty much anything I want them to do. So with Maggie, uh, this is a very serious and difficult dog. And the reason why I set up this system of communication, why is able to do all these things with her and why I set it up, is because if we see another dog and she starts to get reactive, I tell her no, I have her sit, I can say yes. I lure her away from the dog and get her farther away. If she sees the dog, her obedience is better. I have a better chance of getting the dog to listen to me. So she sees the dog and she starts to get keyed up and she starts to get forward in her posture and she looks like she wants to do something, I can immediately ask for obedience. Down. Yes. And then boom, I now pull the dog into my world. And so instead of having her being so focused on everything else and tuning me out by doing obedience this way, I can get her to focus on me and tune the rest of the world out. And that's the important part. See, what happens is owners, our dogs are reactive, and they start to bark and lunge at other dogs, and they tune us out. But if you set up a system of communication that the dogs understand, what happens is they begin to focus on you and tune other things out, and then by cause and effect, other things become white noise, and you become the focal point. What you see so often is that owners are not their white noise and everything else is the focal point. So the dogs don't pay attention. So if I have a system like this and I can get the dog to engage and give it a focus, the more I do this, the more I have around other dogs, I can get her desensitized. So for dogs like this, super important you build their confidence, you boost them up, you make them feel good about themselves, you have clear communication, and you have a system that starts getting these dogs to think better, make better choices. So it's really, really important that you do these things. One, because you're spending time and bonding with your animal, and two, you know, a lot of times we just don't put in the work and the time to build a relationship. You've got to be worth listening to. 
right? And if you work with the dog, Max, come. Yeah, nice work. And she listens to you and she respects you, you're going to have a better shot of being successful when it comes to rehabbing behaviors. But if you don't, you don't put in the time, you don't build the relationship, you don't build the communication, you're going to struggle when it comes to those things. So sit. Yes. So you just see a little piece of how we start to teach these dogs some basic obedience, some food luring, some fun stuff. And you can take this with anything you want to. You want the dog to spin? Follow the food. Nice. Perfect. Now she spins. If I want her to stand up and spin like you saw her do earlier, I just have her to jump. As soon as she jumps, I feed her. Then I just start moving my arms around. It's real simple once they get to follow food. Okay? That's your first step, guys. Learn your markers. Learn your clear communication. And have fun. Super important you just get out here and have fun with your animal. That's what we need you to do. Yes. Nice work. Nice. Yes. So the next segment, we're going to bring out a dog that's already um, trained and he understands what he's supposed to be doing. And what you're going to see is a finished product, a dog that uh, is stable, he knows his obedience. Um, a dog is just kind of a showpiece, kind of a demo dog. And that's what we want to bring out for you and show you how we get him from this, this kind of all over the place. She's focused, but she's kind of not focused and having fun with me to a dog that's laser focused, that's paying attention, knows exactly what it's doing, and not worried about anything in the world. And that's what we're going to bring in next, so we can see that, and we're just going to have some fun. Ain't that right, Max? Ha! Yeah! Welcome back, everybody. We're here for segment three. As promised, you brought Mo uh, out here, our demo dog. Now, we'll give you a little bit of backstory here in a second, but in segment one, we went over exercising, the importance of it. We went over treadmilling dogs, the importance of uh, making sure that your, your dog's exercise needs are met. Uh, segment two, we went over some food luring and basic obedience, how to kind of start shaping your dog and teaching it uh, some obedience and, and some behaviors. Fun stuff, stuff for you to do. Um, so let me give you a little bit of backstory on this dog. This is a really close friend of mine, Joe. This is his dog, Mo. Joe is a, uh, a client and now really dear friend of mine. Uh, Mo came to a severely dog aggressive, uh, so aggressive in fact that he actually peeled the back off another dog like, like he scalped it. He grabbed it, shook it, and tore it open. Um, Joe called me because Mo was on the verge of being put down uh, because of the severity of his aggression. But I'll let Joe tell you a little bit about that. Uh, yes, um, I got um, this dog when he was like uh, eight weeks old. He, uh, we had another dog uh, when he was about, about five months, went to the dog beach. Uh, the other dog uh, that he was uh, living with. Uh, had a had an experience with a, another dog. It, it turned kind of violent. He saw it, so when he's later in life, he's still holding on to it. Uh, the other dog has since passed away, and we were left with a dog that was extremely uh, aggressive towards dogs, towards people, lunging at cars, all of it. And I had a, a kind of run out of options, so I, you know, did find Ben, and then. Uh, we were able to uh, start work on Mo. Yeah, so when Mo came to us, uh, severely dog reactive, we couldn't walk him, we knocked Joe down trying to go after other dogs. Um, we got him to the point now where we're social, we do events together. Uh, Mo's out there showing off around 20, 30 dogs at a time. He does fantastic. Um, super pleased, pleased with his progress. One of the things that we did, we showed you in, in segment two, markers and food luring. First thing we incorporated with this guy is one, giving him a job, having him work for his food. Super important that this guy had clarity and understanding on what his role was, what his job was. He needed a system of communication that is um, clear for him to understand. So then when I started working him around other dogs, I started teaching him things. I knew he was clear on what we wanted. So what we did was we incorporated meal time Every meal time was a training. And so what happened was we started working Mo for his meals and slowly desensitizing him around other dogs. And what we found was is that now he's so focused on his task, so focused on his job, he's able to tune things out. We've even got him to the point now where he socializes off leash with other dogs with no altercations. Um, so we want to show off a little bit of some of the stuff that he's learned. And uh, I'll let Joe take it from here and kind of show you some of the cool stuff that Mo can do. But a lot of these things that he's doing now today, he's able to do this around dogs. And this is what got him started. We were able to desensitize him, to get him to work, focus on his task. And then now we have a dog that's great, gets along with other dogs, doesn't try to attack him, and he's super obedient. So enjoy. I'll let you take over from here. Can I walk back and forth here? Is that all right? OK. All right, Mo. Uh, you want to come with me? Remember, we're here. Come with me. Over here. And sit. And stay. And down. 
and sit and step back in front and heel. Come over here and sit. Leave it. Pick it up. Bring it. Good. Go on. And heel. Leave it. Go pick it up. Bring it. Put it in. Don't you, boy? Uh -uh. Leave it. Leave it. Over here. Good job, Mo. So some of this stuff we incorporate. Um, what we did early on was he started working as for his meals. I started doing obedience with him. Um, we have a kennel, and so I started working on this as having Mo focus on working for his meal, doing obedience, and then start desensitizing him. I'd walk him in the room. I'd have dogs around. I'd have him in the kennel. I'd start working Mo. Have him do his obedience, he looked, I correct him, tell him no, I don't like him lunging at the dogs, work with him. And over time what happened is he became so focused on his task, so focused on the job, um, that he's able to perform and hang out and we started desensitizing him slowly, bringing in the right dogs, making them uh, understand that there are stable dogs that are not going to attack you, and most started getting the clarity. And along the way he became an amazing animal. Uh, Joe's companion, he helps Joe with getting upstairs, he picks up and retrieves items for Joe. I mean, pretty much anything you want, this dog will do it for you. Um, so it's just, it's been a sure pleasure um, meeting Mo and then building a relationship with Joe in the process. I mean, this is the thing about dog training. We're actually changing people's lives. And we want to be able to help you guys. We want to teach you things that are going to give you clarity. They're going to help you understand your animal better. It's good that you understand exercising your dog because that may be the missing component. It's not the end all. It's not the fix. It's not the answer, but it's a piece. And if you don't have that piece and you're missing something, that could be it. And if your dogs are reactive and it's stressed out, it's going to be more aggressive or frustrated. I would be too if I was cooped up and I didn't get out. If I don't get enough mental stimulation, even if you have property and your dog doesn't get worked, you don't teach it obedience, you don't get it out there and you don't socialize it, the dog's going to get frustrated. And what happens is, is you get dogs like Mo. They don't go out. They can't go out. It's impossible because they're reactive. So we have these pieces that we put in place to create clarity exercise them, relax them, and teach them the world's not such a bad place. And you end up with this wonderful social animal that's now a companion, and he does the job he's supposed to do, which is what? Love on us and create peace and harmony instead of stress us out. So if you guys are struggling out there, make sure you give us a call. You reach out to a trainer. Make sure you know the person that you're talking to. You've looked into their work. You've checked out the before and after stuff that they have going on. Check the reviews. Make sure that the quality of work they're putting out there is, is, uh, is there for you to see. You know, if you have an aggressive dog, find somebody that has before and after videos of their, their work so you can see and you can compare it and see if it's something that you need and what you're looking for. So do your research, do your homework. Make sure you get somebody that understands the breeds that you have. Uh, make sure they've worked with the animals like you have before. And, um, and have fun. At the end of the day, guys, incorporate your food, your meals with training. Have a good time. If you want to train your dog, take five minutes, ten minutes a day, two, three times a day. It doesn't take hours. It doesn't take a long time. Little pieces throughout the day. Isn't that right, Joe? Absolutely. You just uh, live life, have fun, uh, try to uh, obviate any problems from uh, the earlier the better. One thing you want to do when you're paying attention to see if your dogs, uh, for me, I'm really big on, on, on working my animals. Just like if you were to go to the gym, 
you know, you don't start off by running a, a 5K or a 10K marathon. You work your way up. You build the dog up, okay? So maybe your, your dog likes to play ball. Start off playing ball a little bit with your dog. Start looking for them to start panting really heavy. What you don't want to do, you don't want to overwork your dog, okay? But you don't want to underwork your dog at the same time. So what you want to do is you want to get out there. You want your dog to be panting a little bit, you know, breathing a little heavy, just like you would if you got some good cardio in. Um, you know, but don't start off with a 30 or 40 minute bike ride if your dog hasn't done any exercise lately. You know, start off with something small, maybe walk on a hill. Uh, you know, work with your dog a little bit. You know, do different exercises, ball playing, working some stairs, anything that you can do to start building the dog up. As they get better, you're going to notice if the dog gets tired, the dog's going to start to lay down on you a little bit, breathe real heavy. Watch those things. You know, you don't want to fatigue the dog to the point of injuring it, but at the same time, the dog's got to have some exercise. They've got to have fun. They've got to enjoy it. So pay attention for those signs. If they get visibly red, the tongue starts getting really red, the eyes start getting really red, the ears are getting red, the inside of the ears, the dog's starting to get overheated. You need to watch out for those things. If it's really hot and the pavement's hot, don't take your dog out. Go early in the morning, you go in the evening when it's nice and cool, and you gotta remember guys, the sun beats down on these guys and makes it a lot hotter for them. So their coat's gonna be a lot hotter than what you're experiencing. So when it's the heat of the day, be careful you don't give your dogs heat stroke, okay? And it's really important after you've exercised, don't give them too much water, don't feed them right afterwards, give them a break, let them wait, because you can give them bloat. We had a client, we did this uh, talk about bloat and the signs and the warning symptoms, and she was able to uh, pinpoint it and see it about three minutes into the, the, the symptoms, took her dog down, Got the surgery, dog's perfect today, no problems. But you can literally have your dog die within 20, 30 minutes. It can happen quick. You gotta be careful of those things, so make sure when you're exercising, don't overdo it, don't overfeed, don't overfeed, don't overwater. You take your time, get a little bit of water when you're done. Every 15 minutes, give them a little bit of water, and then after about a half hour, 45 minutes, they can have some water and you'll be good to go. Make sure you're exercising your dogs, make sure you're training every day, have fun. Do this, you got this, all right guys? Thank you so much, give us a call. My name is Ben Davidson, owner of Devotion to Dogs, and I had a pleasure spending time with you this morning. Take care.